It is an exciting time of year. I always loved Christmas growing up. It's, it's always been a, a special time for us as a family and to me a time to really reflect on who Jesus is to me. Amen? So um, I want to talk about the unopened gift. Pastor Jacques spoke of the unopened gift, but I want to talk about a secondary gift uh, this morning. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would hear your word as we read this scripture, God, that you would speak to our hearts. You know where we're at, and we ask God, we open the heart, and we ask that you speak to us today. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Um, you know, with Christmas, it's such a busy time. I don't know about your family, but it's a busy time. There's the busyness of looking for gifts. There's the busyness of preparing food and running from family, from home to home to visit family. And it's exciting, but it's a busy time. And it's important to not be so busy that we don't reflect on the true meaning of Christmas. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, uh, Pastor Jacques just bas basically shared this story. It says that Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them uh, in the inn. And I wonder sometimes, you know, I, I like to think outside the box a bit, and I, I wonder sometimes if, you know, if the innkeepers would have knew who was knocking on their door, if they wouldn't have made space for Jesus. You know, we have to make space for Jesus in, 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 at Christmas time. We have to make time in the busyness of everything we're doing, in the shopping, and the gifts and everything, to take time with our families, whoever that represents, to remember Jesus. All right? And I think those innkeepers would have been disappointed, I think, from eternity perspective, realizing they could have had the God-man, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, in their inn. I mean, that's pretty awesome. If a celebrity came to town, they'd be, they, they, I think the hotels would be fighting to be able to host that celebrity, you know. My wife went over to uh, a mission trip, I think it was in Russia. Is it Russia? And uh, sh they were there to help the churches. And the pastor and his wife, they didn't have very much. They had this little flat, this little apartment. They had no, not a lot of food. They didn't have much. But they were so honored to have these missionaries come from Sweden that they actually moved out of their house while they were there and gave them the whole place and took the very money they had, the very little money they had, and they provided food for them because they wanted to honor those who were bringing the good news to their country. Amen? And so in saying that, um, we got to make sure we don't put God in shed. Don't put God in the shed over Christmas. Don't just put him, okay, yeah, we're going to take time to pray as a family, but, you know, Christmas is about all of this. We got to keep Christ in the center of our homes. Amen? And I think as we move into 2018, remember that Christ needs to be welcome in my home. I'm not going to put him in the shed. You know, when I got stuff to do and I got work to do, uh, you know, maybe my wife wants me to do work around the house or I want to work on my car, I go to the shed to get busy and do some work. And sometimes we do that with Jesus. We, we put him in the shed and we just go about our life and we're busy, you know, doing what we have to do. And then when we come into a crisis, or we come into a difficult time or we just feel we need peace, we slip off to the prayer shed and we pray and say, Jesus, I need you right now. But we want to make him center to our homes. Amen? Not someone we run to when we just have needs, but someone that is all circumference in our lives. Now Luke chapter 2 verse 8 to 11 says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone, shone around them. They were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. I love this because it's not, the angels, the angels are saying, it's not just joy that we're bringing. We're bringing great joy right? Which will be to all people. It's not just for some. It's for all who are willing to call upon the name of the Lord. This gift is for all people. Say all people. All. And all means all. That includes you. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. You feel like I'm not worthy. God could never love me. I've messed up too many times. No, you're part of the all. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because why? Because he loves and he wants us in his family. All right? It's for all people. And then it says in verse 11, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is really important because the word Savior actually means deliverer. 
And so the angels were saying, listen, a deliverer has been born to you this day. And um, a deliverer is, is um, when you think about a parcel coming to your house, if you, how many ordered stuff on Amazon for Christmas? Any hands here? Okay. Nobody wants to admit it, but I did. So you order something on Amazon, right? And it, and it comes, somebody has to physically deliver that from the Amazon, you know, uh, warehouse or wherever it comes from, they have to bring it to your door and they have to give you the parcel. There's someone responsible for delivering, okay, something. You know, Moses delivered the, the, uh, the Hebrews out of the, 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 the hand of uh, the Egyptian Pharaoh who was oppressing them and he delivered them to the mountain of God where God could come and be their God, right? So there has to be someone to bring deliverance and that's what Jesus did. Jesus brought deliverance, okay? He, and here I want to read, here in Matthew chapter 4, verse 13 to 16. I'm going to read a bit of scripture today. And leaving Nazareth, Jesus came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Nephetali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephetali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, verse 16, the people who sat in darkness say darkness, have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has sprung up. And that's, what, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the light of the world. And the Bible says that these people were in a certain location, right? And light sprung up. Okay? Do you know what that word darkness means? That word darkness actually means, it comes from the Greek word skatos, Skatos. And it actually means shadiness, obscurity. It's like there's no clarity. I, I, don't, I don't know what, what is life all about. I'm not clear. You know, why am I here? Who am I? What's, you know, uh, what's life all about? And, and so there's this obscurity of not knowing, you know, what life is, who you are, you know, what God wants. of You just don't know. You're in, you're in a shadow. And Jesus came like a light. <sighs> And here's your purpose. Here's your destiny. This is what I've created you for. And he brought light to a specific region. And you know what? God knows where you live. Did you know that God knows where you live? He knows where you're at. He has your address. It doesn't matter where you are. God can come down. God came down to me in my midst of uh, drug addiction and alcoholism. And, and, all, and God came right into that place where I was. He knew where I was. He got me saved. He spoke to me through a Pink Floyd song. That'll throw some of your religious wheels off, but that's all I was listening to is secular music. God began to speak to me through that and began to draw me back because he had a heart and because I had praying parents, amen, which is also important. But God knows your address. God knows where you live, and there's a light coming to your shadow. There's a light coming to your darkness, and that's who Jesus is, all right? Now, John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You know, when you follow Jesus, guess what happens? He leads you into the way of life. Here's another verse, Acts 26, verse 18. Jesus came to open the eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, and they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Isn't that good news? I mean, I think, I think we, we have a good gospel. The gospel is good news. God has a plan and a purpose to restore people back into relationship with him. Amen? You know? That's what God wants to do. He cares. Religion is about trying to, to, to uh, get approval from God, to, cut, to appease a deity, to, you know, I'm not worthy, but Jesus made us worthy. See, God wanted to enter back into relationship with us so then we can live a life that's right. And so God is faithful. People say that Jesus is the only light source. That's not true. Jesus isn't the only light source. There's other light sources out there. They're, they're, they're actually counterfeit light sources. 
But there are other light sources out there. And the Bible tells us that um, in Galatians, I'm not going to go there for time's sake, but Galatians 1, verse 6 and 9, you know, Paul is warning the Galatians. He says, even if an angel comes from heaven or if we come and preach a different gospel that isn't the gospel that we preached originally, you know, let that man be accursed because God is not, God's not changing his mind. He has a plan. His plan is Jesus, his son, who's come to redeem and take people from darkness back into relationship with God. There is no other gospel. And many religions today, religion is birthed by people claiming to have angelic visitations. I've done studies on, I don't just ramble this stuff off. I've read books on uh, different religions and cults. And they all start because someone heard an angel speak to them or they had a dream that was different than what God said in the Bible. And then they start a religion. And it's a false light. They think, ah, oh, I'm good. I'm good with God. I'm good. But it's not, a, it's not a real light because the real light is relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not works. It's not based on working yourself to appease God. It's about having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus came to restore our relationship with God. So here's the question. What is the unopened gift? Here it is here. Pastor Jacques shared that this unopened gift was Jesus, and that's true. But I want to talk about another unopened gift that God has given us, and that is your heart. God has given you free will. He's given you an ability to choose whether or not you'll receive him or not. He himself is a gift, but the gift that we've been given is that Jesus actually cares enough to continually come after us. It says in Revelation 3, verse 20, it says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and give you all kinds of religious rules and ruin your life and make you miserable. And you'll have to go to church your whole life. And, and it's just going to be like you're all the fun and party and will be gone. Oh, does it say that? I will come in. We will share a meal together as friends. God wants relationship. And, you know, when it says he wants to spend a meal with us. That means he wants to have fun. Now, when I grew up, my mother comes from a family. She has 17 siblings. My dad has six. So they both came from large families. So to have a meal was like you eat as fast as you can and you go back for seconds as quickly as you can or you don't get any food. How many grew up in a family like that? So you'd be like, you'd rush to the table and everyone's like, right? And so you have to eat fast. So growing up, our, our meals were, okay, come on, kids, time to eat. We'd run. It was like we were like uh, Tasmanian devils, you know? And then we'd leave the table, right? But that, that's not healthy. Well, we'd have conversation, but it'd be around the, uh, you know, bedtime prayers. But mealtime was you eat, okay? Anyone relate to that? And then I met my wife, got married, and she's like, takes a bite, and then she actually wants to talk. And then I'm supposed to respond between bites without choking. So I'm figuring, I'm trying to, it took me years, I'm starting to get good at it, I'm still, still pretty fast. Um, but, but when you eat with someone, it, it's a time of, and, and especially in Hebrew culture, is a time of fellowship. A meal should take, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes to sit and talk and eat and how was your day and you know, it's not a, right? And so this scripture didn't mean anything to me till I understood this. When Jesus wants to come and dine with us, he's saying, let's sit down. Let's have a seven course meal. Let's talk about life. Amen. I want to be your friend. And I love this. We will share a meal together as friends. And so Jesus made his home on earth for 33 years so he could make his home in us for eternity. I'm going to say that again. Jesus made his home here on earth for 33 years for the purpose of making his home in us for eternity because he wants to have relationship. Okay? A couple more verses and then we'll close. John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus said, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home 
with each of them. You mean he doesn't want to live in a shed? No, he wants to be in our home. He wants to be in the center of our life, and that's where we want to have him, okay? Last verse, John chapter 14, verse 8 to 10. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, so why are you asking me to show him to you? When we look at Jesus, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak are not my own, but the Father who lives in me does his work through me. Amen. And so this Christmas, I want you to repeat after me. Don't put God in the shed. Make relationship with him central. And here's, here's here's another one I just want to share quickly. Don't let him pass you by as a savior. Make him your savior. Because he's only a savior. You know, we watch people that, you know, try to honor. They don't know the Lord and they try to honor him. Say, yeah, it was a birth of Christ. And, um, you know, I wanted to try something. If you ask Siri, say, who is Jesus Christ? What did it say? Doesn't understand. understand. You're teaching her? Yeah. But Jesus Christ... um, is a sinner's savior, and he's here to make his home in you and to transform our lives. So why don't we stand together here before we, and just want to lead you in prayer, and then we will have a candlelight service together. What I want to do this morning is I'm going to pray a prayer of invitation to ask the Lord Jesus to be central to your life. The Bible says if you pray this prayer and you believe it in your heart, you have to believe it in your heart, you will be saved. And then if you've meant that prayer, I want you to tell someone today during the meal time, just say, hey, I made that commitment today to the Lord Jesus for the first time. Or maybe you want to say, I'm coming back to the Lord. But he's a faithful Savior. So let's pray together. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending the gift of Jesus, your son. Today, as I hear him knocking on my heart, I open my heart to him. And I say, I want to have a relationship with you. Come and live in my heart. Forgive me for not believing fully. And I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen.